Hi, good, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to our InterCIFAR collaboration on HIV research, uh, InterCIFAR Working Group. My name is Maria Altaire, and I am from the University of Miami. And um, my co-chair for this working group is Kate Powers from Harvard University. And uh, we welcome to this series of seminars that happen quarterly. Today, we have two great presenters, which will be introduced uh, shortly. Uh, but before we start, I just want to um, not only welcome you, but just give you some guidance on how the, this seminar is going to go. We are going to have two presenters. Every presentation is going to be about 15 minutes with five minutes of question and answers. If you have any questions, just put them in the chat and we will be monitoring them and we will discuss them after each of the presenters. Uh, and if you have any other questions or any issues with the tag, please, uh, you can just uh, post them in the chat. Kate. Great. I would like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Nelly Mugo, who is a Kenya obstetrician and gynecologist and a scientist involved in HIV and cervical cancer prevention research. She's an associate research professor in the global health um, department within the University of Washington and the, and the Center for Clinical Research. She also works with the Kenya Medical Research Institute or KEMRI. Um, and she's a reproductive health specialist with over three decades of experience in conducting research focused on both the prevention of HIV and cervical cancer. And you may have seen her work uh, involved in two landmark studies. First, the Partners PrEP study, which really helped inform the policy to use Truvada as a PrEP agent. And she has also worked on the Kenya Single Dose HPV Vaccine Efficacy Study, or KENSHI, um, that's provided the evidence on the efficacy of a single dose HPV vaccine. Um, she's widely published in peer review journals, and she's going to talk to us today about HPV elimination and how inequality may represent a hurdle to elimination um, success. So with that, Nelly, I'll give it to you to take it away. Yes. Um, well, good morning, good evening, wherever you might be. I'd like to start off by truly deeply thanking um, the InterC for collaboration on HIV research in women for inviting me and giving me an opportunity to share this talk. Um, part of my disclosure is that I have a grant from Mark, but that I also made this similar presentation uh, the previous week at, at CROI. So if you heard it, I apologize. Just you might have to listen again. I always like to start this slide and you know, Doug, with the appreciation of the people who contributed greatly either from their body cells like Henrietta Lacks or Dr. Harold Hussein, who won the Nobel Prize for identifying that HPV infection causes cervical cancer. And just to remember that elimination is not easy, but it's feasible and polio has shown us that. And you know, as we talk about iniquity, it's a reminder that scientific evidence on its own is not enough. So I'll look at the burden of disease across ge geography and gender, look at what the WHO strategy tells us, look at the evidence we have on vaccine and some of the tools that we currently have for screening and the population impact when, this population, when these interventions have been implemented. So why HPV at all? You know, in HIV, I think people talk a lot more about Hep B and other infections, but HPV is actually the second most, the second highest infection related attributable risk for cancer-driven um, diseases globally. And most of the infections reside in Sub-Saharan Africa. And the greatest burden really is in cervical cancer. And, um, you know, 5% of all cancers are from HPV, but 85% of HPV-associated cancers are cervical cancer, which of course we know is only in women. That said, there's a, you know, a wide array of other cancers that are important and impact both gender, like oropharyngeal cancers, which 70% are HPV associated, anal cancer, vulvar cancer, penile cancer. Across all these cancer types, HPV-16 is common carcinogen, and that's important when we look at the vaccines. So when we're looking at iniquity, it's good that we look at the glo global map of, um, of disease distribution. And you see from the dark red areas, 
the East and South, Southern Africa carry the highest disease burden. Globally, cervical cancer is the fourth most common cancer amongst women, but amongst a number of low middle in income countries, it's the, it's the number one cause of death amongst cancer death amongst women. We have 604,000 incident cases annually. And if you break that down to what those number of incident cases are daily, it's a huge number of women with about 341,000 deaths. I estimated in Kenya, they estimate you know, 3,500 deaths a year, which is like nine women every day in my country. 90% of these deaths are in low middle income countries. So there is a gradient um, to do with economics. And actually there's data that shows incidence is three times more in low income countries compared to high income countries. However, if you look backwards, you find in the 1940s before cytology, the high income countries had equally high burden of this disease. This disparity can be seen by the range of disease between Switzerland at one case per 100,000 women for, for mortality rates and 56 per 100,000 women in Eswatini. That said, East Asia, because of its large population burden, carries more than 50% of total number of women with cervical cancer. This because it's if HIV, it's a good reminder that the two infections overlap, HIV and HPV. And we know that women living with HIV have a much higher prevalence of high, high risk HPV infection, a higher persistence rate and faster progression to invasive cancer. And overall women living with HIV have a six fold increased risk for invasive cancer. Additional data has shown that 20% of all cervical cancer is attributable to HIV infections. We can see controlling HIV has an impact. On the flip side, other observational data has shown this association between having prevalent HPV infection, increasing risk for HIV acquisition. And in this voice trial, which was done in mostly South Africa, HPV infection was associated with about 2.5 um, odds for, for HIV. So um, the question is, would HPV vaccine have impact? This is just a reminder that men too have HPV but not at the same level as women. And that men living with men, MSN living with HIV have the highest burden of anal high risk HPV. And the oropharyngeal and anal tumors are more common in men. So the reason I think we talk about this elimination is because cervical cancer is one of the very few preventable cancers. We know what causes it. We have tools to screen and diagnose pre-cancer. We have proven effective low-cost treatment for pre-cancer lesions, a highly effective vaccine, and one dose has been shown to be effective. The challenge has been our implementation. And I think this is of what's proven, and this is where the iniquity comes in. I mean, just to crown it all is that early cancer is curable. The challenge, again, has been delay in detection, which brings five-year survival rates to abysmal rates. So in 2018, the World Health Organization came up with this strategy for cervical cancer um, elimination. And they say that the strategic goal of having 90% of girls by the age of 15 vaccinated and 70% of women who are eligible screened with a high performance test by age 35 and again at 45 years, and 90% of all women identified with their cervical disease treated. This strategy could potentially prevent over 62 million deaths in the next 100 years. What we know if you look at the gray line, if we do nothing, that 62 million will stay, will, will have no difference. And this was modeling work done across 78 low middle income countries. But if we add one screen and vaccination strategy one, we can reduce this by 2030 if we had started at 2020 by a third, and that's remarkable. And in 50 years, we could bring down the burden of disease by 92%, and we'll close to elimination in 100. Um, however, for, low in, for, for countries with high disease burden, up to 40 incidents per 100,000, vaccination alone will not take us to elimination threshold. An elimination threshold is four per 100,000. But for countries where the, the disease burden is less than 20, 100,000 person years, this could potentially bring them closer to elimination. 
So I quickly wanted, I think the one thing that's changed the story of elimination is having this highly effective vaccine that works really, really well. And in summary, what this slide tells us is there's a multiple number of studies showing this vaccine has an effic efficacy between 96 and 100% in prevention of precancer lesions and genital warts. And for anal precancer, it's been shown to have an efficacy of 78%, which is remarkable in itself. For people living with HIV, it's been shown, have been shown to have robust and safe immune response, though their antibody responses are lower than those for people who do not live with HIV. And having low CD4 count or detectable HIV viral load has been shown to have a sustained low titer. The important thing though, I'd like you to take from this slide on the chart on the right is the plat two. So the blue line, are the, the, these were children living with HIV boys and girls. The blue line did not have detectable HIV viral load. And the red line, they had detectable viral load. But the important thing is that it's a plat two across the four years of follow-up. The data we don't have for people living with HIV is on outcome in terms of disease. So more recently, we've had really important data on single dose and the efficacy of single dose. And we'll, I'll just show you very quickly the data from India and Costa Rica, which was observational immunogenicity study data from the Doris Tanzania trial and our own study called the Kenya single dose study, which is Kenshi. So, you know, there's been, why is this vaccine so, you know, highly effective and durable? And we've been, it's been shown that HPV, which uses virus-like particle, induces high levels of neutralizing antibodies that evoke a robust memory response with long-lived plasma cells and reactive memory B cells. And you have that makes it a very strong vaccine, but then the HPV virus is highly susceptible to neutralizing antibody. So those two working together then bring out a highly effective vaccine. Additionally, low levels of antibodies in animal studies have been shown to be protective. So the chart on the right shows you um, work from Costa Rica, which was observational, but they followed up this women. Now we have data for 16 years, which was presented in IPVS. Though you see three doses has a higher antibody titer than one dose, you still see the PLAT2, and the PLAT2 continued for 11 years. But the data they showed us last year shows the same design and sustained response for 11, 16 years. So that's remarkable. Additional observational data from these cohorts in India, this is now published data with 10 years of follow-up. And what it shows across single dose, two dose, and three dose, that the number with HPV 16 and 18 associated lesions was zero across board. Now, when you look at the number of women who were seen positive with HPV 16 and 18, which are what was in the vaccine, the high-risk types, that 63 of unvaccinated, had, they had 63 women and very few of the others who were vaccinated, but the outcome, which is important, was no lesions. In Costa Rica, now crossing to South America, vaccine efficacy was approximately 80% across all three dose regimens. This is the Doris trial I talked about. This was working in Tanzania. They had follow up for three years and continued to follow them up. And again, you see that rising titer at seven months, a short decline at 12 months concurrently for all three doses and the PLAT2, that's a sustained plasma antibody rates for all nanovalent, bivalent, and all the different dose regimens. What is also important is that we're able to show that the antibody avidity, which was the binding of antibodies to antigen, was actually a straight line across all three doses. Then I'll show you our evidence for single dose. This was a trial, three arm trial, with a nanovalent, bivalent, and delayed HPV vaccine, and the third arm received meningococo vaccine. And this was amongst 15 to 20 year old um, Kenyan women. And we saw vaccine efficacy for nanovalent in protecting against HPV 16 and 18 incident infection was 99%, and bivalent 97%. And these are similar findings. Now, when we looked at the protection against the seven high-risk types in the nanovalent, this was 95%. But the data that's not being shown here is when we looked at the women, who, the young women 
who did not have any antibodies to infection at the beginning, they did not get any infection. So highly protected. So this single dose has been adapted globally in multiple countries, in Gavi countries and non-Gavi countries. But what I'd like to say is that it's not just a regimen for countries of low income, that the UK, Australia, and Ireland have also adopted a one dose schedule in their countries. And the number of countries quickly adopting one dose schedules uh, are increasing. And currently from this report from WHO, 37 countries globally, it's also allowed Nigeria and Bangladesh, which are very high population countries to take up single dose and initiate the HPV vaccine programs. I know I'm running short of time, but I wanted to show you this population impact slide, which is data from high income countries with, with 60 million vaccinated individuals who were initially mostly girls, multi-age cohort nine to 18, with population coverage for vaccination of 50%. And what you see is that amongst girls who are vaccinated at that age, those are declining, very rapid decline in pre-cancer lesions, CIN2+, for women 20 to 24, but not the older ones. Genital warts came down at 67%, and those had protection, the boys also had reduction in warts. Now there's a recent paper by Palmer showing that in Scotland, the girls who were initially vaccinated in 07, ages 12 to 13, none of them have been shown to have, they have they've not been able to record any cases of cancer in those cohorts. I think what's equally important is to see this work from Rwanda and Bhutan, low-income and middle-income countries, that they were able to achieve 95%, 80, over 80% coverage and reduction in population level HPV types of the vaccine of up to 95%. So this is achievable, so that 90% is feasible. So the next strategy for elimination is screening with a goal of 70%. We have over time really three standard tests, which are cytology, visual inspection, and the HPV test, and I'll quickly not go through that. But I wanted to tell you that visual inspection was seen as a tool for low-income countries, and when you put acetic acid on the cervix, you see these white changes that can be seen with the naked eye. So nurses at lower level uh, um, health facilities can use it, and it's not expensive. So, and at the trials, it had a sensitivity of 80%. The problem is it's subjective, has variability with the observer, and in practice, sensitivity went down to 50%, requires a lot of continuous training, supervision, and therefore has not been able to achieve population screening coverage. Now, more recently in the 2021 um, WHO guidelines, the HPV test, has been selected as the primary screening tool. It's highly, um, it has a high negative predictive value and results are reproducible, but it has low specificity, increasing risk of um, treatment requiring a triage test. And for many countries, it's not been adapted because of cost and may not be easily adapted to, single, to screen and treat. I think this is the data showing that it's a superior test. And the India data showed that one single round of HPV testing reduced incidence of advanced cervical cancer and death. More recently, I think this is really interesting, they evaluate in deep learning with automated visual evaluation where they use a smartphone, which has had a multiple number of images um, creating an algorithm for diagnosis that can be used as an aid for visual inspection. And more recent data from Zambia has shown a sensitivity of 85% and 86% specificity, much higher than both VIA and on um, VIA and, and cytology. I'll just quickly glance at the HPV self sampling with a woman actually taking the swab for herself has been shown to increase coverage for screening. Women like it. And there's a lot of data showing similarity in, in using it to test for precancer lesions, similar to clinician sampling. So when it comes to treatment, I just wanted to show you this no do cap. This is a sample from Kenya, where our screening uptake is 16% against the target of 70. Our treatment of screen positives is 30%. This makes me sad, against a target of, um, of 90. So I think I need to move quickly because there are other people who will be presenting, and I know my time is almost up. So 
previously there was very little resources going into doing this research on HPV in low income countries, but more recently, the NIH has instituted this cascade network, which is looking at HIV, people living with HIV treatment and screening. There's work towards finding an HPV therapeutic vaccine with an envision of having a prophylactic and therapeutic vaccine. And the World Health Organization is working on preferred pro product profiles for a point of care test. And you're encouraged to add your comments. That's the cascade. So in summary, we should be, we have evidence on single dose. And if we use science, really that should go up. We urgently need a point of care HPV test and investment in other tools. And that for people working in HIV field, we have a high recurrence rate of lesions in that population. But we must have population coverage for this to work. So I'll close this because we're talking about equity and say, as we find these exciting scientific discoveries, we must keep an eye on equity. The tools are not enough. We need holistic approaches. HIV communities should not ignore HPV. And we must be careful that as these disease rates go down in high-income countries and stay in low-income countries, that the space for investment doesn't go away and it doesn't become a neglected disease. So I think I'll close there. I think you read that remark from Martin Luther King about the injustice of inequity in healthcare access. Thank you. And I apologize for going over time. That was excellent, Nelly. Thanks so much. And you do have a few questions in the chat. So uh, one of the ones is um, uh, Shakina Rose is interested in understanding the uh, HPV and HIV co-infection rate in Kenya. Do you have a sense of that? Oh, I see. Hmm. I have to think about what, what are the, so the number of live, people living with HIV who have uh, HPV infection. Actually, I have, on one of our studies, I think we had found almost 50%. And wow. that becomes a challenge. This, this becomes um, maybe 40%. And this becomes a challenge when you have uh, HPV as a screening tool and the need for an additional triage test. So people, I think there's, there's, there's a lot of work coming up to look at diagnostics, you know, what, what other diagnostics in HPV genotyping can you use to predict who's likely to have a lesion? So current WHO guidelines also state that if you have HPV 16, the possibility of, you know, progressing to cancer is really high and they propose you just treat. And I didn't talk about treatment with thermal ablation or the ablative therapies, which are really simple can be done with nurses and it's just you know 40 seconds on the lesion it's safe it, it carries a battery and is easy to implement that's great um nelly i'm curious um you you've convinced me that one vaccine a single vaccine is perfect you do not need the the triple or two additional boosters is in, in our highest prevalence settings, is it a function of demand or is it a function of access or is it both? Like how, how do you address the inequity? What are you doing in Kenya maybe to, to ensure that there is a strategy for getting people vaccinated? So I'll just also recap that the evidence for single dose efficacy the evidence we have is limited to women ages 15 or women less than the age of 20. So even WHO guidelines say if you're older than 20, use two doses, that's one. Now, the thing about um, most of our countries, we are dependent on the Global Alliance for Vaccine Initiative, which is really important because it's delivered access where there'd be no access. If you think that multiple countries have not started and high income countries started 20 years ago, um, having vaccination. So Gavi has been really important in providing access, but I think we need a lot more advocacy. We've also had a lot of anti-vaxxers giving misinformation, and this vaccine is really safe. But if you Google, you will find some terrible misinformation that has also kept people from getting vaccinated. Now, beyond that is the limited resources for training and community education. 
there's there's not much money put into that. We put a lot of money in R and D in discovery, but now when we have a product, we start weaning off resources for delivery and education to communities, and that's a real problem. So what we're doing in Kenya, I think the technical working group I know is working to changing our guidelines towards single dose. So I'm looking forward to that. And I'm hoping that that will allow for a multi-age cohort and expanding the age band of girls who get who access vaccines. That's great. And there, there's another question about um, whether or not there's any plans to do self-testing like the swabs used for anal um, uh, testing, home testing of HPV. I, I must really apologize that I am a women's doctor, I'm a gynecologist, and I haven't paid a lot of it. No worries. No that. worries. So I don't want to give an answer to something I haven't looked into, but I haven't found literature talking about it. But potentially, I think it should be feasible. Okay, great. Um, and can you comment on the research gaps that remain related to precancerous outcomes? of HPV infection in women living with HIV and barriers, including the role of misinformation to uptake the highly effective vaccine. Some of the same things you've touched on, but. I think there's a, there's, there's a lot we need to learn on how to do better for that population. The, we, we can screen and we know how to find the lesions, but treatment, you know, effective treatment for that population has been a challenge. They have, I didn't show that slide, but there's a 50% recurrence rate in women amongst for precancer lesions. So, and you know, some of the therapies that have been used like in micro mode, I don't know how much of it has been done there, but we really need to find better treatment modalities. And I think this is where the vaccine is so important that if we can just primarily protect this population from getting HIV, from getting HPV, the challenge is the high infection rates when they already have HIV, because they're twin viruses, they're both driven by the same um, behavioral exposure. Great. Well, that's great. We've gotten a lot of questions. There was a question that came up about why the association between HPV and HIV, but I think you've said that it's the same, it's unprotected intercourse puts you at risk for both. And then the immune compromised state puts you at risk for progression of HPV instead of the ability to clear it. So awesome. great questions from the group. We really appreciate your presentation. Um, Nelly is talking to us from Kenya where it is now close to 7.30 at night. So we really appreciate her jumping in and I'm gonna turn it over to Maria for our next presentation. Thank you for being the audience. Thank you so much, Kate and, and Nelly, for the wonderful presentation. Our next speaker is Dr. Rebecca Adelman. Uh, Dr. Abelman is an assistant professor at the University of California in San Francisco in the Division of Infectious Diseases at the San Francisco VA Healthcare System. Her research is sex-based differences in aging-associated comorbidities among people, among people living with HIV and the contribution of menopause to comorbidities in women with HIV. She has extensive clinical and research experience as a clinician and a researcher and in treating people living with HIV with a special interest in women. She's worked with the, uh, large cohorts and she also uh, presented, has presented an international conference, including CROI last week. And so uh, Dr. Adelman is gonna talk about InstiSwitch during menopause is associated with accelerated body composition change. Welcome Rebecca, and we are looking forward to your talk. Well, thank you so much for the kind introduction and thank you Maria and Kate for the invitation to present our work. And I'm gonna be presenting as introduced about InstiSwit during menopause and its association with accelerated body composition change. And I'd just like to also recognize my co-authors who are listed here and their incredible contributions to this as well. And for disclosures, I also uh, received some institutional support from Merck. So as an introduction, integrase strand transfer inhibitors or INSTIs have been implicated in greater weight gain than other ART regimens, both in treatment naive 
and ARC, ART suppressed individuals. Women with HIV may be particularly affected with some studies demonstrating greater gains in weight, BMI, and waist circumference, a marker of visceral adiposity with INSTEs than in men with HIV. Tenofovir alafenamide or TAF use may also contribute to greater weight gain. Menopause, represented by the permanent cessation of menses, has also been associated with increases in BMI and total and visceral adiposity. So taken together, this had led to two knowledge gaps. One, whether menopausal phase at the time of switch to an insti containing regimen affects the trajectories of waist circumference and BMI. And two, whether the sequelae of insti use is modified by aging women, particularly given many of the studies looking at insties were in premenopausal women. To address these knowledge gaps, we conducted a longitudinal study of retrospective data from women with and without HIV in the Max Wise Combined Cohort Study from 2006 to 2019. Inclusion criteria were women who were ART suppressed for at least two years and did not have prior exposure to an INSTI before the switch visit. Visits were excluded if women were receiving treatment for active cancer or tuberculosis, if women had an HIV RNA greater than 200, or if they were pregnant or postpartum within two years of the visit. And then women without HIV had visits excluded if they reported being on PrEP use. Women were divided into menopausal categories, so premenopause, early and late perimenopause, and postmenopause using antimalarian hormone levels, a biomarker of ovarian reserve. Women were then categorized into three groups. So women with HIV who were newly started on an INSTE or INSTE positive, women with HIV who were not on an INSTE at a similar time point or INSTE negative, and then a comparison group of demographically similar women without HIV who will be demarcated as WWOH in the subsequent tables and slides. We used mixed effect models to evaluate changes in waist circumference and BMI by menopausal phase, and we used time intervals of six months for interpretability. So here are the characteristics of the index visit, and I know this is a busy slide, but I just want to highlight a few uh, aspects here. So first are the ages. They differed slightly within the groups, and the women in the NC positive group were slightly older with a median age of 52, whereas women without HIV were 47. Um, this was reflected in the menopausal stages. So higher in percentage of women without HIV were in premenopause compared to the women in the NC positive group and the NC negative group. And a, a smaller proportion of women without HIV were in menopause compared to the NC positive group. In terms of HIV related factors, 64% of women in the INSTE positive group were on TDF, whereas 79% of women in the INSTE negative group were on TDF at the index visit. And then in terms of efavirenz use, 1.9% of women on, in the INSTE positive group were on efavirenz, and 29% of women in the INSTE negative group were on efavirenz, and that's at the index visit. Now I'd like to bring your attention to the, the, the bar graphs on the right. Waist circumference is above, BMI is below. Orange is the INSTE positive group, blue is the INSTE negative group, and gray is women without HIV. What I really want to highlight here is that across groups, so menopausal categories and groups, that women were in the BMI range of obese, um, regardless of group or menopausal phase. So here are the waist circumference trajectories by menopausal phase. Orange is the INSTE positive group, blue is the INSTE negative group, and gray is women without HIV. And then the table below are the point estimates, um, and that's the change in waist circumference per six month interval. First, I'd like to bring your attention to the figure on the left, the panel on the left, and this is premenopause at time of switch. And what I'd like to highlight here is that women in the NC positive group and NC negative group had linear increases compared to women without HIV, but there were no statistically significant differences between women who were in the NC positive group and NC negative group. Now I'd like to bring your attention to the figure on the right, which is late perimenopause at switch. Here you can see that women in the NC positive group did have increases in waist circumference when compared to women without HIV, but women in the NC positive group had accelerations up until month 41, followed by decreases um, when compared to women without HIV. Here's the time of menopause at switch. And again, orange is the NC positive group, blue is the NC negative group, gray is women without HIV, and the table below are the point estimates. And you can see here, similar to the, pre, the late perimenopause group, that compared to women without HIV, whereas there were some initial decreases followed by increases in the NC negative group, 
that women in the NC positive group had increases up until month 38, followed by decreases compared to women without HIV. Here are the BMI trajectories by menopausal phase. And here, the table below has the point estimates of the change in BMI per six month interval. For premenopause at switch, you can see that um, when compared to women without HIV, that women in the NC negative group had increases, um, whereas women in the NC positive group had increases until month 26, followed by decreases. However, when comparing the two groups, there was no statistically significant difference between the NC positive group and the NC negative group. However, in late perimenopause at switch, you can see that there are similar trends as were seen in waist circumference, where in the NC negative group, there were linear increases compared to women without HIV, whereas in the NC positive group, there were increases until month 37, followed by decreases. At menopause at switch, you can see that uh, the trends were very similar to late perimenopause. So the NC negative group, when compared to women without HIV, had linear increases, whereas women in the NC positive group had accelerated increases until month 40, followed by decreases. There were some limitations to this analysis. So NCs were examined as a drug class rather than by individual agent. There were small numbers of women on TAF-containing regimens. We did perform a sensitivity analysis limiting to women on TDF, and the findings appeared similar. And given the ages of women in the cohort, it is possible that some of the women with HIV were exposed to older NRTIs that may have altered the body composition trajectory seen here. In conclusion, switching to an NC-containing regimen during premenopause was not associated with accelerated gains in weight circumference or BMI. However, switching to an NC-containing regimen during perimenopause and menopause was associated with early accelerated increases in weight circumference and BMI. Taken together, our findings suggest that menopausal phase contributes to the reported body composition changes after switching to an NC-containing regimen, which could have important clinical implications for midlife women with HIV. And for future directions, we're going to evaluate cardiometabolic disease parameters across the menopausal transition with and without switching to an NSTE. Um, with that, I'd like to conclude and just acknowledge everyone on this slide, in particular our participants and our funders. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for this wonderful presentation. And if anybody has any questions, please post them in the chat. And while you do that, I will ask a couple of questions. I think it's really fascinating as we are now using more and more INSTE to really uh, tease out and understand what's happening with, with the weight. Um, and uh, so you did mention about how teasing it, you know, out whether it's TDA versus TAF, versus TAF. And I, I, you know, I would like to know if you can comment a little. I know you didn't have enough women on, on TAF, but I, I would like to know if you can comment uh, on that. And now I know we have some questions. So if you... I'm sorry, I, oh, I'm not sure if I the, understand the oh, question. The, the teasing out TDF versus staff uh, on, mm -hmm. on weight gain. Yes, so I think that's an extremely important question. We had, as you mentioned, a very low proportion of women who were on TAF, mm -hmm. especially at the index visit, which is why we conducted a sensitivity analysis, just excluding women who were on TDF. Um, which allows us to see if some of the effects that people have attributed to TF, which may be some weight suppressive effects, if those attenuated our results. And we actually found that the findings were similar. Um, I think moving forward, we're hoping to expand our analysis as more and more, so we have more and more women who are on TAF to see if we see similar trajectories. But as of now, we don't have a lot, a high proportion of women to make that comparison in this cohort. Wonderful. I don't know if that answered your question. Yes, I, yes, it did. Thank yeah. you. Uh, so we have a question by uh, Shikina Rose. And um, can you share why women on PrEP were excluded? Um, and uh, she's uh, also doing some work on reservoirs during menopause and viral mm -hmm. suppression. But I think the question is about why women on PrEP were excluded. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for the question. So we didn't exclude them entirely. We excluded visits where they reported being on PrEP. And the reason for that is we didn't want to um, complicate any of our uh, comparisons that uh, because many of these PrEP formulations are women who are on TDF. So we wanted to make sure that we were comparing to, to women without HIV who weren't receiving any kind of antiretroviral therapy that could have altered the trajectories that we were trying to look at. 
And uh, we have another question from Nelly Mugo. Uh, what are the alternative proposed for postmenopausal women living with HIV? I think that's a very important question. Yes, yes. And I think this study is, we're really just trying to see the effect of INSTI switch mm -hmm. during these menopausal phases. So none of this is really trying to make a recommendation to treatment guidelines. But I think what this could really do is provide some evidence for a patient, for a conversation with patients and patient-centered decision-making um, so that if women are getting switched to an insti containing regimen, that this is something that's discussed with them. Um, I think there's obviously a lot of opportunity to continue to study. First of all, if women are not switched to an insti um, or switch to an insti during premenopause, what happens with the, with the trajectories if that if you see a similar effect, because this is really just looking at switching to that regimen during these various menopausal category phases. Thank you. We do have uh, some more questions uh, from Schooling. And um, do you think, and I think you have kind of comment on, on this already. Do you think uh, you would see weight changes in individuals continuing on INSTE through the reproductive aging, uh, or do you think it's just based on the change? So I think the question is whether if they continue from insti, would you see the same trajectory uh, during the menopausal changes? Um, I'm not sure if I fully understand the question. I so think do, do you think that, you would see the changes in those who are on insti but not switching? Whether you would see yes, those changes? got it, got it. Um, and I think that, and I'm looking at the question now. And I think some of this, Eileen, to your point, I think we are seeing some of the changes that do happen naturally during the transition to menopause. So that is some of the weight changes that we are seeing, BMI and weight circumference, but it does seem like there is this added effect with INSTI switch, um, which is why we saw these differences compared to women without HIV. Um, I don't know what will happen if women are continued, oh, sorry, continued on an INSTI. Um, <laughs> very strict light timers here, um, but that's something we're certainly interested in looking at. And I think it will, as you can see in the graphs, there is some, de so with a lot of these trajectories, it was increases followed by decreases. So I would be curious to see what happens as women are on INSTEs for a prolonged period of time, what happens to the BMI and waist circumference trajectories. Um, I think the other piece that we're interested in looking at is, and given B some of the limitations with BMI as, many people um, on this call are aware there are lean mass losses that occur across the transition to menopause and how much of that is contributing to some of the trajectories we're seeing as well. So we're hoping to, to look at all of those things. I hope that answered your question. I, I think so. <laughs> uh, so there is another one I think you did mention when you were talking and uh, when you were presenting, but uh, if you could just clarify, how did you, the stages of menopause, how were they defined? Uh, whether it was self-report, symptom, or, or lab measures? Yeah, thank you so much for that question. So we know that self-report in our women is challenging because there are periods of amenorrhea, which may lead to inaccurate determination of menopausal categories. So we have serial antimalarian hormone levels, which is a biomarker of ovarian reserve. And we had a cohort of a group of women who had reliable final menstrual periods and we found that around the time that each category was around five years. And so we used time to AMH undetect the time that AMH became undetectable to help determine our menopausal categories um, by five year ranges. Yeah. But we used the same categories that are in the straw criteria. Okay, so uh, I'm trying to, I think some of the next questions we can kind of put them uh, together. Um, so, is there a what is the me mechanisms, whether it's biochemical or more non metabolic, uh, that could be uh, theorized to in the reason behind the, the increased weight uh, associated with insta um, in women uh, during the perimenopause? Yeah, I think this is a great question, and this is something that I don't have the answer to right now. However, there was a presentation Roy, in 2023 that was looking at just mouse models and in vitro data and looking at the estrogen receptor and 
in adipocytes and looking at um, exposure to certain antiretroviral drugs, including INSTEs, and did find that when that there was an association between um, the estrogen receptor and dolutegravir use that changed thermogenesis and lipolysis. So I think that could be a potential explanation, although I think it's something that merits further study. Thank you. And I think just a couple more about things that maybe you looked at or you could consider looking at is um, whether there were, what, what data on previous regimens could be explored and see uh, whether that would be associated with the their results. And then a comment about that the, the sample seemed to be large women with a BMI around 30. Um, so if you can comment on, on those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Th those are great points. So we are looking into some of the other regimens that women have been on. We do have some of the data, for example, in women who are on DDI and D4T. It's actually a relatively small proportion of our women. And we um, are looking at also just removing women who have, uh, looking at women who have been exposed to fabrins and seeing if we see similar um, trends. So that's those are things that we're going to be looking at as well in more detail. Um, and I agree that it's extremely important to also look at those things. In terms of <clears throat> the BMI categories, I think we that's also an interesting thought to see if we see similar trajectories based on different BMI categories. I know Dr. Lahiri, who is one of the co-authors, had a similar, um, looked at a similar cohort, so sub-cohort of hers um, as this analysis, and did find that when looking at weight trajectories, that women who were in lower BMIs had more um, accel accelerated increases in weight um, compared to women who were at higher BMIs. So the fact that we see this effect, even in women who are in higher BMIs, I think um, suggests that that these changes are, um, are observed in our cohort. Okay, so I don't see any more questions. And this was wonderful. And I want to uh, thank you uh, for these two wonderful presentations, uh, Nelly and, and Rebecca. This really was an amazing. And thank you, uh, the audience, for the wonderful questions. I also want to thank Alberto from the Harvard CIFAR, who put uh, this webinar together and organized and is reminding all of us that there will be uh, next working group webinar on June 13th. We will be circulating the talks uh, in the next few weeks or a couple of months. And um, and then Alberto is also reminding us that there will be a recording available on YouTube uh, so you can share with your CFAR, you can share uh, with your groups. And, um, and I really, um, it was really wonderful. Thank you so much for being on today. And, and thank you for uh, for these wonderful talks. And, and so Maria, Maria oh, go ahead, go ahead, Rebecca. I was just gonna say, I'll put my email. I realized I didn't have my email in here. I'm gonna put my email in the chat if anyone has other Perfect. questions. If people that want would be to great. follow up with me. And Kate. Excellent. And, and just a reminder that if you are not part of the working group, if you're not receiving regular emails from the working group, um, Alberto is also put in there the uh, registration link to the working group, but you can go on the Harvard uh, University Center for AIDS Research website um, and sign up as well. So please join us. It's, it was so lovely to see over 60 participants on today's webinar, um, and we look forward to sharing with you some guideline updates in June when we get together for the next webinar. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so Have much, Rebecca. Day. This was wonderful.